Eric the Turf Teacher Jones. Teaching you life lessons, business strategies, and leadership. Let's grow together. Hey everyone, Turf Teacher here. This video was recorded on January 24th, 2023 on our Turf Talk Tuesday webinars. We discuss integrated pest management for the landscape manager. Check it out. And so we're going to talk uh, integrated pest management. So we'll talk about 50 minutes. Uh, that's what's required for the board um, to get your credits. But it's a fun topic. I love talking about this. And so guys, if you have any experience with this or you are implementing any of these practices with your customers now, uh, feel free to talk about that. Just unmute yourself or raise your hand, do whatever you want. And uh, let's have some good conversation about IPM uh, uh, that we are um, using in our in our properties now because all of us, all of us are going to uh, face one of these clients that's going to tell us we don't want any pesticides put on our properties. Is anybody seeing that right now from any of their clients? Eric, we want no pesticides on our property, especially no Roundup, but we still don't want to have insects or bugs or weeds or anything like that in our turf grass. Has anybody experienced that so far? No. Not? No. We've had no. a few. We've had no. a few that are 100% against pesticides. And I was in a meeting with the Nursery Association this past Friday uh, with our um, lobbyist that goes before the state Senate and, you know, some of the issues that they were talking about was pesticides. So pesticides is always, always going to be an issue uh, with us here in the green industry. Now, these same clients, though, when you start talking about integrated pest management, they're going to open up their ears. <clears throat> they're going to want to hear some of these practices that can be used um, that, guys, I think we can charge a whole lot more money for and make good money off of it and save uh, on the chemical use. Now, does integrated pest management totally eliminate pesticides? No. It doesn't. It doesn't. It just saves them for the absolute last resort. And, you know, um, if, if they want to pay us to hand weed, you know, that's our choice. <laughs> we, do we keep them as a client or do we move on to somebody that we can do it? But there are customers who are willing to pay to have a pesticide-free property. And so what we're uh, going to do first is we are going to identify um, what is a pest. Well, it's any pest or anything that is a destructive or troublesome insect, animal, weed, microorganism, or pathogen can be termed a pest. And it's really up to us whether we are going to claim them as a pest or welcome them as a welcomed guest. Now, can anybody tell me an instance, especially with a plant material, that that this plant can be a welcomed guest or it is going to be considered a pest? Think of all the plants that we know, whether it's tree, a shrub, a turf grass, Hawthorn seem to be um, susceptible to both um, fungicide, I'm sorry, funguses and insects from what I've seen since I moved down here from Michigan. Okay. All right. Yes. And, but in the plant world, when we're on, a, when we're on our customer's property and we're thinking plants, the plant itself, is there one in particular that jumps out at your jumps out of the top of your head that that is a guest in certain situations or a pest in another situation. I mean, you can go with clover. Do what? Clover. Yeah, yeah. That's a good example. And when is it a welcomed guest? Well, if you got uh, honeybees or want to uh, promote nitrogen in your ground, you need clover. Yep. yep. Or if you're, you know... If you're a big hunter and you're wanting that on your property for deer management or, you know, food plots, yes. But let's think in terms of a turf grass in itself. What about Bermuda grass? Yeah, it's good for sports fields. 
It's good for sports fields. People absolutely want to play golf. They want to play football, baseball, softball. That is a very popular turf grass when it comes to playing, playing sports. But if you have a tall fescue lawn, you don't want to have any Bermuda grass creeping in on your, your fescue. So good example is Bermuda grass. It can be a welcome guest or it can be a pest. And when it is a pest, it can be hard to get rid of. Now there are four major types of pests. We have our weeds. Yes. Primarily our, our big money maker in lawn care. Uh, everybody's getting ready for, you know, those, those, uh, those first rounds of uh, pre-emergent disease agents or pathogens is another. And then we have our insects, which is our invertebrates, you know, skeletons or uh, animals with the uh, outside skeleton. And then we have the, uh, the vertebrates, which is our animals with backbones. And <laughs> uh, one of the coolest classes I ever took in college was vertebrate biology because these, uh, these guys were, are very adaptable and they can overcome a lot of things. Same thing with our invertebrates, uh, the insects. It's a whole totally different world uh, when it when it comes to the insect world. Now, with our weeds, you know, we see the dandelion there. Uh, you know, kids love picking them. They love blowing those little seeds all over the place. But who do you think is the biggest carrier of these weed seeds? Humans. Humans, yes. It's going to be us, the landscapers. When we're in a yard that has dandelions, that has crabgrass seeds, remember, crabgrass can produce 2,000 seeds per square foot when it's growing strong. All those seeds are going to be carried to the next property if we don't implement some IPM practices with that. And one of the first things we can do is actually take our backpack blowers and blow off our mowers before we move to the next lawn, brush off our pants. You know, you see guys out there that's been weed eating all day, you know, in between jobs, they're taking the backpack blower and they're, they're blowing the grass off their pant legs. And then they, you know, blow it off their mowers. They're keeping themselves clean. So they're not taking those weed seeds to the next yard. So pest differences, we can have continuous, sporadic, or potential. Continuous is nearly always present and requires regular control. I would say that our crabgrass is a continuous. And maybe this is not ethical of us, but I hope they don't come up with a pesticide that totally eradicates crabgrass because it is a money maker for us. You know, we, we get two treatments out of it. Uh, for pre-emergent, uh, we're probably going in and doing some post control with it, but it's a money maker for us, but it's always going to be there. Sporadic could be migratory, silical, or other occasional pests that require control once in a while. And this could be your broadleaf weeds. This could be, um, you know, an insect that's coming in occasionally, uh, every so often. And then we have our potential not pest under normal conditions, but can require control under certain circumstance. They have the potential of being a pest. And that would be, let's say, our Bermuda grass. It has the potential if our neighbor has it in their yard, we have the perfect fescue lawn. We don't want to have it growing over to us. And we may have to separate it with some, um, you know, shrub beds. And make sure that it's uh, uh, that there we have a strict border control, and now and let not allowing it to uh, to come through. So, so, what is a pesticide? A pesticide is any substance that can that can be used to kill a pest or prevent or reduce the damage that it may cause. Now, here we have our typical homeowner stuff that they can pick up at any big box store. Um, can any of the homeowners go out and purchase a restricted use pesticide? No. no, they can't. What do you got to have to purchase restricted use pesticide? A license. That license, because the dealer is going to write down your license number, and they got to keep track of who they sell the restricted <clears throat> use pesticides to. So that's good. Homeowner can't do it. They can't even purchase it to use on their own property. 
and I apologize for that phone. Uh, I meant to turn it off before, uh, before we got started. Uh, but a pesticide, it's anything. If we're spraying, <laughs> you know, if, if a farmer's putting out, uh, you know, diesel fuel on his gravel driveway, it's a pest. It's being used as a pesticide, not legal, but if he's using it to, uh, to kill weeds, it is a pesticide. All right. So some pest management goals and terminology that, uh, we should know goals of pest management is either prevention, suppression, or eradication with prevention. We want to keep the problems from occurring. Uh, suppression, we reduce the pest populations to acceptable levels. That acceptable level is going to uh, be determined by you and your client. We've got clients that could care less uh, about weeds in their yard. They don't mind that clover. I've even had a client tell me once before, he said, hey, Eric, I'm not worried about the clover. He said, it stays green all summer, you know, and it blooms once a week. Why do I want to get rid of it? They just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> then we then we have uh clients that you know would fire us over one uh you know broadleaf weed in in their turf so you have to determine what it is that they are okay with and then eradication is eliminate the pest population now when it comes to insects especially do we want to totally eradicate the problem no no we really don't because that means that the beneficial bugs that are eating it or targeting them may, you know, pack up and leave as well. Except for, I don't know, any of you guys seen any of these little guys around? Spotted lantern fly? Mm. No. You know, the first, uh, the first case was here in uh, Kernersville, North Carolina. And uh, it was uh, brought in by a uh, trucking company. And, uh, they started noticing all the, uh, like the sooty mold that was growing on the truck where they secrete a, um, like a honeydew and it turns. And so they started noticing they had to wash all the trucks and it was caused by spotted lantern flying. So the ag agents, and uh, a good friend of mine, that's a chemical rep, uh, Tony Goad, they were called in and, uh, you know, they're trying to, uh, to take care of that situation, but they're afraid that that's going to be a big, big problem here in North Carolina. With um, our mode of action, that's how the pesticide works, whether it's a poison, repellent, et cetera. Selectivity, you know, how many organisms does it affect or is it, uh, you know, uh, it is a selective herbicide going strictly after broadleaf weeds or non-selective killing everything. Systemic, some pesticides will enter the tissues of the pest, crop, or animal, and they are transported within. Contact, some pesticides do not translocate within the pest plant or the animal. So it's only going to kill, and a lot of times it'll only kill the area that it touches. So you have to make sure you spray the entire uh, pest. And then residual activity is the effective lifetime of different pesticides that will vary from hours to weeks, months, or years. And residual activity is one of the main reasons whether a pesticide is deemed restricted use pesticide or general pesticide use. You got your rups and your gups, the general use pesticide. And luckily, pretty much everything we use in lawn care is going to be a general use. Yeah. We're not really jumping into those restricted use pesticides. We may sometimes, uh, but typically we can get by with some of the general use pesticides in our programs. And with resistance, this is when the pest population is no longer controlled by the pesticide. And it's usually due to the elimination of susceptible individuals by repeated exposures. Like I said, these little critters, they're very smart. Mother Nature's on their side, uh, and they are going to develop a resistance, especially if the same pesticide is used over and over. So we've got to change our mode of action. We have to change our uh, brand of pesticides. You don't keep using the same stuff over and over. Types of pesticides especially what we're going to see definitely herbicides for weeds, insecticides for insects and related arthropods, fungicides, rodenticides, uh, miticides. We may use, uh, um, you know, the stuff for the nematodes, maybe some mollusks, bacteria and once in a blue moon. Um, definitely growth regulators is a big thing for us. 
How many are you using growth regulators when, when you prune a large property and then go back and hit it with a growth regulator to save money on the labor? Works phenomenal. Yeah. You're going to, you know, you're, you're only going to prune once and it's going to dense up that growth. You hit it when it just, you know, that, that new burst of growth comes out, you hit it, it's going to stop it. You don't have to prune uh, into the following year. Turf tech. Huh? Turf tech. Turf tech. <laughs> T-A-C. Yeah. Oh, turf on, tech. On your, yeah. For your, for your turf grass. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we've, we've used on it on turf grass, you know, occasionally, especially like on some larger sites where we don't want to have to weed eat as much. Uh, but you know, definitely on big pruning jobs. Love it. Um, pheromones. These are chemicals that affect the behavior of other members of the same species. You know, moths use pheromones to attract mates. And so we'll use them to attract them into a trap. And so a uh, good part of integrated pest management would be, you know, using traps and, and, and lights to actually get rid of some of these insects. So what is IPM? I've found two uh, similar definitions. IPM is the coordinated use of appropriated control tactics to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level. Again, that acceptable level. What is it that what is it that your clients are going to allow for? And then the combination of appropriate pest control tactics into a single plan to reduce pests and their damage to the acceptable levels. Basically, we're taking multiple things and combining it into a plan. And the first part of it is we're going to have to monitor. We have to set our thresholds or what is our acceptable level, and then we're going to have to monitor it. So when we're there mowing, we're going to keep an eye on things. We're going to see what's going on. Are they getting insects on their azaleas? Are they getting more weeds in the shrub beds? We're just going to have to watch, and we're going to have to teach our crews how to do this. But we can divide it up or group it into six major steps. Identify the pest and understand its biology. Now, if we do have to make an application, what is the number one reason we have a pesticide failure when we make an application? Ms. Smith calls us out. She's like, Eric, I've got a problem with my azaleas. I got a problem with my roses. I, I don't like it. What drift. Saying, Charles? Drift. Drift. Um, drift is a bad, bad thing. It is. It's illegal. We, you know, there's there's guys getting in trouble all the time uh with with it. But prior to that, because if we got drift, we've actually made we've made an application. This kind of goes prior to the application. They pruned it wrong. That's that's uh, uh that's that's yeah. Pruning is a bad bad thing. You, you <laughs> we cut back crepe myrtles. We're gonna get aphids. I mean you know uh they're they're gonna they're gonna be there. But yeah, what I, I you would know? say, I would say it? that we misidentify the pest. Hundred percent, hundred percent. We got to know our bugs. We got to know our pests. That is the number one reason we have pesticide failure. We incorrectly identify the pest. And if we <clears> don't <throat> identify the pest correctly, then we're using a pesticide that's wrong. We've got the wrong bug. We're getting the wrong pesticide. We don't know that the, the, what the weeds are or the fungus is. We're getting the wrong fungicide or herbicide. We got to know it. And once we identify the pest, we got to know its biology and its life cycle. When is the best time to actually kill the pest? Is it, you know, if it's an insect, is it during, uh, you know, uh, the, the molting period? Or is it when they're fully adults? We got to know that life cycle and biology. Once we've identified it and know the biology, we got to monitor the pest. We got to see how many's there. We got to determine if the threshold levels of the populations have been reached. And again, this is going to this is going to to be direct contact with your customer. Hey, yes, you've got some damage to your azaleas. You know, um, 
if you want to make an application, we can make an application or we can set up some traps for you or whatever it is. You have to you have to let them know when is it going to totally wipe out their azaleas or is it just going to set them back a little bit? Determine that. And then consider all the various management choices that you have for that pest. And then we're going to implement the tactic or tactics that control the pest with the least harm to everything else. And then we have to write down what happens, what worked and what didn't work. Because we're going to run across the same issue with other clients. And this is what they're paying you good money for is your knowledge is the fact that you've seen this at other, other properties. So an overview pest ID, again, the most critical factor in any pest control program, we got to monitor, we've got to scout. We've got to keep our eyes open on our properties, finding the pest and taking samples to estimate their populations. Determine whether the pest population is likely to cause enough damage to justify the cost of control. Seriously, yes. If she's just got, you know, three azaleas up at the foundation and the the, the chemical is going to cost more than to replace the azaleas, they need to make that determination whether or not they want to, to proceed with an application. We have natural controls and measures of forces like predators, pathogens, parasites, even changes in weather. We had a <laughs> class on that last, last Tuesday where we talked about natural pest controls and how we can use them as landscapers. And then we have other situations where we can use cultural control. You know, this is crop or site management to reduce pest numbers or damage. Sanitation, remove food, water, or shelter. Mechanical controls, cultivate disc or mow, remove by hand. Exclusion is with screens, traps, and barriers. Biological control is the introduction of predators or pathogens. They even have turf grass seeds with a pathogen on the seed that will actually kill some of the insects that damage our turf grass. Host resistance, you know, naturally occurring and biologically engineered. Maybe we need to replace those roses. You know, it could be it's grandma's roses that's been transplanted there, and she doesn't want to do that. So we may have to do other means to, to protect them. And then quarantine and regulatory control pests that occur over a large area that are or endanger public health. Government agencies may take action. And you may see that with that spotted lanternfly. And then last but not least is chemical control, the use of pesticides to kill, repel, regulate attract or otherwise interrupt the pest life or life cycle. So again, using that chemical, you got to know what bug it is and mm -hmm. what stage of its life cycle it's in. And then record, write down, take pictures on your phone, definitely document everything that you're doing in this IPM program. And here we're talking about, you know, that threshold or the, the injury level that the customer needs to make that decision. You know, you've got your number of pests. It's increasing over time. And as it grows all the way up at the economic threshold, that's where we need to treat. And there's, there's a fine line here. When it reaches that economic injury level, we may not want to make the application because it's going to cost more than actually replacing the plant or the crop. A lot of this has to do with, you know, agriculture. And it was invented for agriculture. It started out, IPM started out in our agricultural crops. Uh, again, the control strategy, our natural and applied controls. You know, we just kind of mentioned that in the previous slide, biological, mechanical, cultural, <coughs> physical, environmental modification, genetic host or genetic control, host resistance, regulatory pest controls, and last but not least, our chemicals. And so with resistance, these are the bugs um, here in the first block. Uh, he's resistant. He's, this, is, this is Will Smith in uh, uh, what was the movie he was in? Men in Black. What was it? Men in Black. 
No, well, that was a good movie too, but the one where he was by himself when legend, legend, legend. Yes, I am legend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, here he is, you know, because he wasn't affected by it. And so, you know, was his genes passed on to the next generation. And that was sad because his, you know, his wife and daughter died in the helicopter crash trying to escape the Island. Uh, you know, his daughter may have been resistant to, uh, to the disease as well, but this resistant individual, he's going to pass his traits down to the next generation. And then this generation is going to pass it down to the third generation. Whereas, you know, there's just a handful of them that are susceptible to that pesticide that you keep using over and over again. So the idea is you're going to have to change your application, your mode of action, so that these insects don't develop the resistance to the pesticide. So what is IPM? Let's break down these words. Integrated pest management. Integrate is to combine two or more things to form or create something. So we're taking multiple ways of controlling this pest and bring it in into a plan. The pest is the animal or insect that causes the problems. And then management is the act or skill of controlling and making decisions. And that's why I love the word management. I love the word landscape, <laughs> landscape manager. It states that we have skills and that we're able to make these decisions and move forward with it, combining everything that we can to eliminate our pests. Initially developed for agricultural, provides a process for identifying pest problems, and is designed to determine whether the cost of a particular pest management action is worth the result. Do I spend the money on the pesticide? Now, treatments are not made according to a predetermined schedule. Treatments are made when and where monitoring has indicated that a pest will be uh, at an unacceptable condition or level. So this kind of throws a lawn care program out the window, don't it? Because everything that we do in lawn care is based on a predetermined schedule. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready to do, you know, two rounds of pre-emergent. <laughs> but think about it like this. If we uh, have had a client on our program for, let's say, a year, we've taken over a bad property. It's, you know, the grass looked horrible when, when we took it over. And they've been on our program for a year and we've plugged and seeded it and got a good stand of grass, a good, healthy stand of grass. When it comes to weeds, you know, we don't necessarily have to mix everything in that tank for, you know, that third round. We don't have to put our fertility in the tank and mix it with our post-emergent. We don't have to do that. When it comes to the weeds, only spot spray where it's needed. That's how we take the IPM approach to lawn care. Yes, we're probably still going to do our pre-emergent treatments because it's got the fertilizer in it already. But when it comes to the weed control in the summer, you know, if we're mowing it a little bit higher, if we can convince our clients to mow it at four inches, you know, or four and a half, we're definitely going to reduce our weeds. That is a mechanical way. That is a cultural way. We're, 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 taking our mowers and raising the decks, which is going to shade out the weed seeds come, you know, late spring. With unacceptable conditions, when it's economic damage, yes, we're, we're going to make every application we can to, to save somebody's livelihood, especially the farmer, you know, or the greenhouse, you know, the, the growers, you know, that depend, you know, hundred percent on their, 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 um, income from growing crops. We don't want economic damage. Medical damage is damage caused by passing of the pathogens to humans and domestic animals. You know, what, what's the thing going around now? They said there was a little girl in South America that was affected with what here recently bird flu. It had jumped from birds to the first human in South America. Mm -hmm. This can be very, very scary. Aesthetic damage. This is the presence of a plant or animal that causes undesirable change in appearance. You know, they may defoliate the plant. They may kill it. They may leave a sooty mold all over the plant. Then we have 
pests that just have an annoying coexistence with us. They're not really damaging us. They're not damaging our plants. But we go outside and, you know, we have to take a floss water or we get covered in gnats or anything like that. All right, Terrence, I see your questions. Can ants be resistant? Yeah, any insect can develop a pesticide resistance, um, to, especially if the repeated uh, exposure to the same pesticide over and over. So with economic damage, easily assessed in agricultural, forestry, and other related <laughs> settings, home examples would be termites eating our wood, <clears throat> garden vegetables being lost, clothes moss, and even Dutch elm disease. And Dutch elm disease was a, the, the disease was brought over. It came over from Europe. Uh, here's the termite damage. Like I said, this causes major economic damage. And our structural pesticide brothers, they, you know, they make a good living. It's, I, I would say termite is probably their uh, crabgrass in their business because they're always making treatments for that or putting out pre-emergent and helping uh, you know, clients with the spikes in the ground and everything else. Is there a pre-emergent from Bermuda? Um, I'm going to say no, you know, because of the way that it grows. It actually is brought in, you know, from the rhizomes and Stalins. Um, you know, there are some Bermuda seeds. So if, if you had Bermuda seed or something that was supposedly taken over um yeah your pre-emergent would prevent that from coming up but actually you know us taking clippings and having it on our mower deck no it, there's really no way probably to prevent that other than you know shading it out a good thick four inch tall fescue lawn is not going to be susceptible to the bermuda grass because the Bermuda grass is, is beneath those four inches and it's going to be shaded out totally. Uh, medical damage, you know, the bubonic plague, Lyme disease, malaria, encephalitis, you know, and it, and it bothers me tremendously knowing that there is, uh, you know, preventatives for malaria and that these poor kids and, Poor people all over the world are still dying from malaria each day when there is a vaccine for it. And there is, you know, ways to treat it if they are infected with it. It was one of the first, you know, shots I got in the army, you know, going to places that, you know, there, that we would be susceptible to it. Uh, histoplasmosis. This is an internal fungus infection that a lot of chicken farmers are getting. Uh, you know, breathing in all of that, you know, that manure smell, that ammonium smell that comes from, you know, the chicken houses. And then toxoplasmosis, this is an <laughs> affliction of the central nervous system that a lot of pregnant mothers uh, will infect the unborn child by just touching meat that's infected with it or kitty litter uh, when they're changing out the cat box. <laughs> Here you have bubonic plague. You know, it was uh, transmitted by the, uh, by the rat, and the flea would bite the rat, drink the blood. The bacteria would multiply in the flea's stomach, and then the flea would bite our human friends. And the bubonic plague killed, you know, tremendous amounts of people back in the day and uh, was, was a, you know, scary, scary thing. Uh, you know, because our medical professionals weren't up to date as they are today. Lyme disease, you know, right from the tick, my dog, Sergeant, my German shepherd, he's got Lyme disease and he'll have it forever. And, you know, he got infected as a pup. It's just one of those things that uh, every so often we may have to give him a little medicine, but the vet checks him out every time. He says, it's just one of those things. He's going to have it. Now, humans get Lyme disease too, but what is the number one pest control for a tick? Natural pest control that Mother Nature puts down here that is a great thing. People don't want nothing to do with this animal. 
Um, it's solitary, hangs out by itself, can't supposedly, get rabies. What, James? Supposedly, supposedly a possum. The possum. You're 100% correct. Possums. One possum will eat up to 5,000 ticks in a summer. Mm. So he's got his belly full, right? And you know, look, possums, we, we see, you know, occasionally at night. That's about the only time we're going to see them. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the one thing that gets the possum is, is the cars. But, you know, these guys like being by themselves and uh, they help us out tremendously. And the best thing about it is they don't get rabies or nothing like that. So they're out there. They're out there doing wonders uh, for natural pest control. You know, uh, another way to uh, take care of even more ticks than the possum. What's that? Prescribed fire. Prescribed fire. Yeah. 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 Burn their home. Yep. They like that moist leaf litter. You, you take that away from them. They they're, drop. They're gone. Yep. yep. Um, and I know the army always did a tremendous amount of, you know, burns on bases. And I'm wondering if that was just to, you know, to protect the soldiers. I mean, it could be from the ticks. Um, malaria. Yeah. What's, what's mother nature's number one control? For mosquitoes was what's what animal enjoys what what's the mosquito would be considered their steak dinner what bat. Animal, the bat that's right mr murphy the bats love the mosquitoes but people are scared of bats you know they see one flying around or they that just the, just the thought of having one in your attic and people are freaking out but when they come out, at, you know, and, you know, we have more problems probably with mosquitoes, you know, at dusk time. And that's when, when the bats are coming out and they're feasting on these guys. And, and, and it's a good thing. With the histoplasmosis, again, the chickens, you know, the pathogen is transmitted to humans and domestic animals by common wildlife. So whatever it is that the chickens are getting involved with. They're passing it on to the chicken farmer. And then here is the mother handling the kitty litter or contaminated meat. So I remember when, uh, when I was going a lot with the army and, and my wife was pregnant with the kids, the girls, my father-in-law would always come over and change the litter box for her every single night. He made sure that she did not have to touch it just because of what this can do to the unborn child. I say it's just another good reason not to have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I have to admit, and I think I think it, this is the slide deck that I actually have a picture of me with, because I, dude, I'm like you. I, I never thought I would love a cat uh, until the girls brought home uh, who they called Meow Meow, and uh, he's no longer with us. He, he he ran off one night, and we knew that you know with age and everything, because he this was when they were tiny. Um, they just went off and died, but, uh, I did, I had a, I had a special place for him in my heart, uh, with aesthetic damage, what constitutes an undesirable change is highly personal. People just have this attitude about nature and about plants. Nature just seems messy to them. It's a lack of understanding of the natural world. And ornamental plants are probably more susceptible to attitudes as anything. Just like when we, we were taking care of an 88 acre site, um, property, we had, um, um, the site was full of Nandinas and they got a new director over the uh, retirement com community and the new director just did not like Nandinas. And somehow or another, he found the money to dig up all of these Nandinas and go back and plant something else just because he didn't like it. Plants, they're just, they are, there's a lot of hate towards a lot of plants. Another thing that we, we met with the, uh, um, the lobbyist Friday at the, at the green and grow show was, um, our state Senator, one of our state senators does not like crepe myrtles and he's wanting to ban crepe myrtles on like all state parks, state owned property, you know, talking about removing the ones that are there and planting something else. Like he just has, he has a, 
just a hatred of the crepe myrtles, which, you know, give a lot of work to somebody, but, you know, I, I love crepe myrtle. I don't know, you know. That, I mean, that is, they, they, definitely a, got their, they got their place in landscape, and that's for sure. They do. They do. Uh, you know, and you know, just look, look how long they bloom. Like, I mean, we got color all summer from crepe myrtles. And the problem is, is how people, you know, the pruning of them, uh, and well, they're, they're a tree. They they're they're not a bush. They're exactly. A tree. Yep. And they're supposed to stay upright. Yep. And we don't we don't top none of our crepe works. No. no. We uh, we thin them out. All we do is thin them out and keep a great shape. Yep. And if somebody wants us to murder them, we just don't do it. We'll tell them they can call somebody else. But uh, a crepe myrtle is a tree, kind of yep. you know, just like a dogwood tree. Yep. And when you leave them alone and just thin them out, boy, they're beautiful. They are. They are. People just probably plant them on the wrong place. They do. Exactly. You're right, Mr. Martinez. And it's the designers, you know, planting the uh, the Natchez crepe myrtle in front of a uh, shopping Windows. center sign. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got tenants that are renting space. They're like, hey, the, the cars driving by I can't even see that I have a pizza shop here. And so the property manager tells the landscaper, hey, cut back the crepe myrtles so we can see the signage and it just creates a natural mess, but you know, they should have never been planted there in the first place. Um, that, that gives us job security. It does. It does. Um, appearance of the pest itself. People freak out, you know, guys, spiders do more for us than probably any other insect out there. They're killing some of the bad stuff that will kill our plant material. And people are scared of the spider. And there's only, what, four poisonous spiders in the United States? So it's not like every spider that we see is going to be detrimental to our health. They're, they're beneficial to our health. And so leave them alone. And a lot of people don't even like the cobwebs. I mean, you know, yes, I don't like running through a cobweb or spider web, you know, when I'm mowing underneath a tree. But it's, it's, it's part of our business. It's, part of, it's just part of our duty. Um, but these guys need to be left alone. The box elder bug here, gorgeous bug, you know, and they don't, they're not, they're not really detrimental. You know, they do congregate in several hundred, but they're, they're, they're just visiting. They're not really, I mean, I can't think of anything that they're going to hurt our landscapes with. We do have a, a tree on campus that, you know, every so often we'll see, we'll see this. and. Students are scared to death of them. They're like, don't do this, you know, get rid of them, cut the tree down or, or spray them. No, you don't want to do that because they're going to be gone in two days. Now this, yes, we want to get rid of the only way to get rid of that is probably to cut it out, remove it, throw it in the fire pit, right? Um, Ten caterpillars. Do what? Ten caterpillars. Yeah. Yes. But you know, they, they do some damage. They do some damage. And then these guys are aphids. And, you know, talking about making sure the next generation happens. What is, what is, how, how does, how does that happen? What does the female aphid not need to produce young male? She don't need the male. That's right. They're asexual. So the next generation is going to happen no matter what. And aphids are very detrimental to the landscape and they can, they can cause a medical and an aesthetic damage. The aesthetic damage is all the honeydew that they produce and stuff, which can damage cars. If there's a large enough population in the tree and it's dripping on the paint or somebody can run through the honeydew slip and fall, it can become a medical damage when that happens. And you know, the best way to get rid of these little guys is beneficial wasp that will drill a hole on the side of this insect. The wasp will lay the eggs inside the aphid. And so these eggs have a nice little warm place to hatch out. And when they hatch out, what do they have readily available for them? Food. Food. 
They Ooh. eat the aphid from the inside out and you'll see like a black hole right on the side of it. And that's where, where, where they've been injected and they come out the same place. But aesthetic damage, it's fear of future damage that will cause the concern. Release of the fear, relief of the fear comes from learning the biology and ecology of the pest. Same thing with snakes. People are scared to death of a snake. Well, that snake's scared of us. They don't want nothing to do with us. They just want to be left alone. And the black snake is one of the coolest things to have around because what's it going to keep from getting in the house? Mice. Mice. You know, do what? They eat the copperheads. And they eat the copperheads. Yes. I've seen that with my own eyes. They're going to eat the poisonous snakes. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> and so if you, if you have one, you know, just pick it up and move it. You know, if you don't want to pick it up and play with it, just, you know, get a shovel or something and take it to the edge of, you know, the wood, the wood line. They do so much for, you know, our environment. It is, they're part of the ecosystem and they get rid of these, these nasty little pests. Yes, they do get birds, eggs, and stuff like that that we want to keep, but that's that's kind of the the risk. You know, they keep the mice population down. Voles and, and, and moles and stuff, they eat that as well. So learn about the snake. and Learn how it can help, and you're not going to be so afraid of it. And sometimes the damage can be the product of the animal's activity. The problem can be solved by just cleaning away the evidence, but leaving the animal alone as with a spider web. But to me, that's beautiful. You know, I see that in the garden. I'm like, wow, you know, mother nature is helping us out here with some natural pest control. And I love seeing the spider do its thing. You see these insects fly into that web and they are attacked and they're wrapped up and they're doing their job. Here, let's look at about the aphids. You know, all this honeydew dropping. We have a jogger running through here that slips and falls and didn't even pay attention to it. It becomes a medical damage. Static damage if we had a car parked right here on the, on the side of the road and all that honeydew gets on it. It's going to be a problem. All that coming from aphid. These little guys will 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 do that. Now, who will protect the the aphids? There's a creature that will like treat them like king and queens and protect them. Mm -hmm. Ants. Because what, <clears throat> do, what do ants want that the aphids produce? So they move. Or... Yes, they want that. They want that. They want that stuff right there on that leaf. They want that honeydew. They use it. They eat it. And so they'll protect the aphids. The fear on insects can make an aesthetic damage a medical one as well, which is called uh, entomophobia, you know, just kind of like arachnophobia, which is the scare of the spiders. And this fear can be overcame. It's by studying the, the animal, learning its life cycle, and learning why God put it down here. Nuisance problems. Groups of animals or plants trying to coexist with humans. Fungus, gnats, sparrows, squirrels. You know, I don't see a squirrel as a pest. I don't. I mean, I love the little guys, and I love watching them play in the trees. But ever since we've had Labrador retrievers, we don't have any. They're just, that's Mother Nature's natural pest control for squirrels is a lab. And uh, there was one brought up to our patio the other day, and they're, like, looking at me like, Dad, look what I've done for you. I've brought you a treat. Um <laughs> <laughs> they are super proud that they had killed that squirrel. <laughs> and uh, you, you got to be pretty brave to attack one of these things because I bet the squirrel gives them a you know, pretty good run for their money uh, and, and does some scratching on that nose. But our invasive plants, seedling trees and exotics that come over. And so, you know, pest or guest, no animal in itself is a pest. The way each of us feels about the visitor determines whether the animal is welcomed or not whether it is a pet or a pest. And perfect example is this little creature right here, you know, which if you've got grandchildren or you've had children at one time in your life, you've probably had one of these little guys in a tank. You know, they don't live that long, 
but your kids want to get and play with them and they love this little thing. But if they were to get up at night and go get a drink of water out of the refrigerator and they see one of these little guys run across the floor, they're standing on top <laughs> of the table. Same little thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a different situation, how we feel about the animal. And this little guy right here is cute as a button, you know, uh, but I don't want to see it at night either. It's kind of hard to, to believe that. And before we finish up here, we do have a uh, example of whether it's a pest or a guest. This was in the 70s, so it's a while ago. The National Park Service was uh, contacted by some golf course residents that kept getting bitten by mosquitoes. So the National Park Service comes in. They find out where the mosquitoes are coming from, and uh, they realize that, that it was in the river that run by the golf course. Well, downstream, local farmers and lower-income residents would fish this river to supplement their diet. You know, it was an abundant in fish. It was abundant in fish because there was a lot of mosquito larvae. And the fish were feeding on the mosquito larvae and were there and the farmers and lower income residents could fish and supplement their diets. Well, the national park service took care of the golf course residents and they introduced BT to kill the mosquito larvae. What do you think happened to the fish? They went away. They went away. They packed up and left. And so there was no fish for the farmers and lower income residents, people that needed this river. And what was su supplied to them free of charge by mother nature, they couldn't get it. So a lot of the times we overreact, we overreact to a situation and we want to kill the insect or kill the larvae before we realize what it's actually doing. Mm -hmm. This for these people, this was a welcomed guest. They wanted the mosquitoes because the fish took care of it just because the golf course residents wanted to go outside and play golf and were getting bit by mosquitoes, you know, they just needed to, to purchase some, some spray to keep on them or wear a mosquito net. They can't see you. No. So anyway, guys, we're, we're over our time. We've talked for 50 minutes, any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, on that, I'm going to stop the share. Uh, so we should be right here. Any questions, comments, or concerns? No, no. All right. And so what will happen, I'll download the roster here from zoom. I'll upload it to the department of agriculture's website. So you should see this apply to your license here in about 30 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it you guys for, for your talk. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening, too. Yes, sir. Bye bye. Thank okay. you. We'll see you. See you. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, Eric the Turf Teacher Jones. Teaching you life lessons, business strategies, and leadership. Let's grow together. If you're needing irrigation, landscape, or pesticide credits, check out my website at turfteacher.com. Every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., we host Turf Talk Tuesday for pesticide credits and have online courses for both irrigation and landscape contractors. There are also several opportunities to get your credits at one of our seminars that we do throughout the southeastern United States and information on our Christmas lighting course. Check it out again at turfteacher.com. <laughs>